Namaste and good evening to all of you. Tonight in our satsang, I wanted to continue in a creative way the idea presented in the last satsang which I did a couple of three weeks ago, where I spoke about the very great importance of Anahata Chakra and the values of Anahata Chakra and the practices of Anahata Chakra in the spiritual practice. And uh, we debated at that time that actually spirituality without Anahata Chakra is actually possible. And it has been done in various environments on this earth. It's not the most satisfactory thing to do. It's not the best outcome. And that's why many, many spiritual meridians, many, many spiritual paths, they are definitely trying to include some fair amount of Anahata Chakra in their grand development of the human being, because without Anahata Chakra, there are lots of impediments. Ultimately, if you think about it technically, First of all, you think about Sahasrara, the crown, because Sahasrara or the crown chakra is sort of the goal. So you would simply, if you think simplistically in a simplified way, you would say Sahasrara, 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 more Sahasrara, more Sahasrara, that's it. But ultimately, the first corollary of this is that there is very, very little probability that you will stay in Sahasrara 24-7. Staying in Sahasrara 24-7 would be equivalent with stopping existing in this world, like having a body and living with it on planet Earth when you are constantly in Sahasrara becomes like useless. Maybe avatars sometimes come with the consciousness of Sahasrara and they unfold the divine activity, being aware of their divine identity, and then they just leave. The second, when if we go from one to two, the second is, of course, Kundalini, the mother principle, the earth, because who goes to Sahasrara? It is Kundalini, it is our terrestrial nature, it is the earth element that is rising under the form of Shakti, under the form of Kundalini Shakti, to go to Sahasrara. And therefore, we can simplify the human existence at Muladhara Sahasrara. If you are not in Sahasrara, then you are in Muladhara. And when you start practicing again, Muladhara goes back to Sahasrara. That would be like black and white, like binary code, zero and one. You are off or you are on. And then you are off, you take a break, and then you are on. Like you are sleeping unconsciously or your kundalini rises and you are in full consciousness. Even this paradigm is considered to be extremely primitive and extremely simplified. And therefore, the next step is when you add an intermediary point, which is usually in the mid chakra between the muladhara and the crown, which is exactly the heart. So if you describe the human being as muladhara, our vitality, anahata, our soul, and sahasrara, our goal, then automatically we say from time to time we move to the spirit, and from time to time we relapse in the soul. Remember that Christian mystics describe the evolution of the human being or the existence of, a, of the human being as a triadic existence. Body, soul, and spirit. Body as a representative of matter, and they don't want you to live in the body. Soul as the place where you stay 23 hours out of 24, which is the heart, and spirit 
which is sahasrara, when you go in ecstasy, when you go in states of superconsciousness. And therefore, this compromise of anahata actually basically makes us see that there is a foothold. We don't stay all the time in muladhara because that would be being inert like matter. We don't stay all the time in sahasrara because then we'd be in a state of pure spirit all the time and there would be no activity on earth. There would be no compromise. But when we are in the mid state, then we are halfway between the heaven and the earth. We are in what we call the soul, which is a sort of a psychomental, emotional conglomerate of structures of the human being which reproduce spirit. They are not pure spirit, but they copy pure spirit by the famous metaphor used in India that you can reflect the sun in a bowl of water. So your soul is not the sun. Your soul is the reflection of the sun in a bowl of water, but that sun, that reflection copies the sun pretty well. In many, many respects, it looks just like the sun and it has the same dazzling effect and others like the sun, like the pure spirit. Well, if we brought spiritual practice to say, okay, muladhara, sahasrara are the two ends of the scale and there is a foothold in anahata. That defines a kind of spirituality, and it is a spirituality which is pretty archetypal, exactly like Jesus gave it. It's not a coincidence that Jesus, who is considered to be an avatar and one of the great exponents of divinity on earth, he actually teaches this path of blending the heart with the crown, he doesn't teach just an Atma Yoga, a sort of permanent spirit consciousness. He describes the daily life as a state of the heart, as a state of Anahata Chakra. However, history demonstrates it that there are not only three chakras. There are seven, actually. So between those, there are also four other chakras two below Anahata and two above Anahata, which theoretically each and every one of them can be a foothold in the spiritual practice. Not as archetypal as Anahata, perhaps. We saw that the presence of Anahata in the spiritual practice definitely has some benefits. But when we look at the others, we also see that, okay, a great Anahata Chakra in your spiritual practice, but for example, to have no Manipura Chakra, is it possible? Yes, it is possible to have strong other chakras and a very wonderful Anahata Chakra, and there you stay in the daily life, and from time to time some peak experiences take you to Sahasrara. What about some Manipura? Nope. Is it possible? Yes, it is. Again, we have lots of structure, especially in Bhakti Yoga, in Christianity, in some Sufi uh, lineages, where we see exactly that, that Manipura Chakra would not be there. On the other hand, when we look at the very powerful exponents of the heart, we see that if they had a great Manipura Chakra, they fared better. Like generally, for example, the Christian saints that had a lot of fire, they are much more famous and productive Christian saints than the ones who didn't have some fire. But did they really need Manipura Chakra? Maybe not directly for their states of love and for their states of surrender and for their states of humbleness, but indirectly in the rest of their daily life, if it gave them more self-discipline, more willpower, more dynamism, more courage, then hey, why shouldn't you add something to your heart chakra type of spirituality? And in this way, I, I don't know if I'm going to go through all four of uh, the other chakras, now that I created this uh, little scaffold in your mind. But uh, definitely today I felt inspired as counterpart of talking about Anahata 
and the value of anahata in the spiritual practice, the almost indispensable value of anahata in the spiritual practice, to at the same time talk a little bit tonight, why not, about the shocking, uh, perhaps, value of Manipura chakra in, the, in one's spiritual practice and one's spiritual life. And that I said it's shocking because in the beginning Manipura looks sometimes as the very antipode of spiritual practice. Not only that multiple monsters of this humanity, from uh, Genghis Khan till you name them, have been super examples of Manipura. Manipura, Manipura, Manipura. And those people, nobody can claim that they were spiritual, except in a philosophical, Kashmiri, Shaivistic, monistic way, where everything is one, because everything is the oneness of the divine consciousness, and even Genghis Khan and Adolf Hitler are belonging to that oneness in a mysterious way, in a certain way, which uh, we cannot fathom emotionally, because it's way above emotionalism. But generally, many people, when they think about Manipura and the way we talk about it, they see it as being a sort of a antipode or opposite of the spiritual practice. First of all, Manipura chakra seems to be, and it's not entirely, entirely correct chakra-wise, that Manipura chakra seems to be a sort of a place of ego and place of personality. Like people that have a strong Manipura chakra, they definitely have a lot of personality, they definitely have a lot of ego, they definitely have a lot of me, 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 look at me, see me, and all that stuff. And this presence of personality and ego seems to be the very antipode of spirituality. As one of my great indirect teachers, a teacher of one of my teachers called Suren Goyal that I got to meet personally as well, but I didn't take much teaching from him. Suren Goyal even had made it into a yoga dictum, into a proverb. He always used to say when people were coming to a discussion about this, he reminded them and he told them, ego in, yoga out. Yoga in, ego out. Like he simply could not put them together. And we all know in spirituality that we have this conflict. Of course, as I intimated a couple of minutes ago, the problem is a little bit more complicated because we define ego under the psychological features of a lot of Manipura. Like people who are proud, arrogant, full of vanity, who have their cup full and would not listen. And people like this with full of themselves, who always, when they see themselves in the mirror, they go and kiss their own reflection in the mirror because they are so beautiful and extraordinary that they are like in love with themselves while the rest of the world is kind of, uh, no, not really. You know, so when people have this kind of temperament and personality, then we call that ego because that's the most contodent and the most uh, painful aspect of ego. The truth is that ego means any form of coalescence or conglomerate where we agglomerate or consolidate ourselves against something in our being. For example, persons that are in Svadhisthana, they don't have a Manipura type of ego. They can't even understand why the Shogun of Japan was like that, or why Genghis Khan was like that, or why Napoleon was like that. Uh, because they never feel that kind of emotion. But it doesn't mean that highly Svadhisthanistic human beings, they cannot be very selfish. Sometimes you see Svadhisthanistic persons who have a painful agglomeration of ego, but it's more like an animal defending its bone. It's more of an instinctual, instinctive type of ego that I want this and I'm like this and this is my... Per Not at all a Napoleon. 
not at all a conqueror of the world or some, not at all an imperialistic person, but nevertheless a person very closed in themselves and very egocentric. So even the water can generate an egocentrism, only it's not the classical ego. Uh, Swami Ram, the guru of the guru of Swami Lakshmanju, the, so the last but last but one guru of the Kashmiri Shaivism in the lineage which was present in Kashmir, he said he could dis define the ego even of a worm. He said if you take a worm and try to crush it, it will defend itself, it will avoid. So even the worm has a sort of basic love for itself, which means in, he, in its case a sort of instinct of conservation, a sort of a primitive, primitive, muladharistic, blind, absolutely basic uh, instinct to conserve itself at the cost of the rest of the universe, if that need be. So in this way, I just want you to expand the concept of ego, but for many people, this concept of ego is most classically related to Manipura Chakra, because the egos of Manipura Chakra are the most visible and the most painful. And um, that's why for many people say, how can you have a big Manipura Chakra? and be at the same time spiritual, because it seems like a contradiction of terms. That's why I said uh, in the beginning I would even like to elucidate this famous issue of the eradication of the ego, of the annihilation of the ego. Many teachers of asceticism, especially when they do the yogas of the higher chakras, like especially Jnana Yoga in India and uh, the derivate forms of Vedanta, Vedantic Yoga, and then some elements in yoga related with Ajna Chakra, with Sahasrara, they depict the world in very black and white colors. Like simply the problem is that the normal person has an ego and when you say I, when you say what I like, what I want, what I am, you always talk about your own ego. Sometimes it can be with wings in Svadhisthana, in Muladhara, there can be a complex psychological structure of your ego, but we always refer to Manipura as personality. This is me, this is who I am, and you staunchly believe in it. The personality is a mask, and by the French name person, it means nobody. So it's the mask, the personality, the persona is a mask and the nobody, and yet people cling to it formidably much. People say, yeah, but I am like that. You keep on clinging to a personality which has been defined by the DNA from your parents, by the astrological structure under which you are born, by the formative fields, morphogenetic and others, coming from your country, from your race, from the geographical place where you are born, from the education coming from society, school, television and media. And all these, they are encrusted like a mask. And we defend this mask, and very few people have the courage to sometimes abandon their mask and to say, yeah, I can be something else. At least I can try for three days or for three months to be very, very different. No, there are people who, let's say, don't manage to have detachment. But the samurai of Japan, they managed to be detached even on Manipura. They had a culture on Manipura. And on Manipura, they were ready to give up everything, including their own lives. Like complete detachment while the psychological level was on Manipura. So detachment is an option eventually. Most people in this room and in the world, but in this room as yogis, are not detached because they don't sincerely want to be detached full on. 100% on. And that's why you know, we talk about such values, you know, but we could theoretically decide three months, I'm going to be detached. Exactly as that man from the example of Swami Rama, who decided that for 30 days, for one month, 
he was going to absolutely tell the truth. 100% absolutely the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. No. And that changed his life enormously, totally, radically. You know? So in the same way, it doesn't cost anything for anybody to say, I would like to be like a samurai for the next six months of my life. And I will be, among others, I will be detached. Detachment as seen from Manipura Chakra, not necessarily the ultimate detachment from the Kanchukas of Sahasrara and so on. That I cannot fathom that one yet. My level of meditation and my level of consciousness is not there yet. But at least I have the Christian mystics. They didn't call it detachment like in Buddhism and in the Zen culture, in the Samurai culture. They called it dispassion. So in Anahata, they would call it dispassion, like don't have a passion for anything. Imagine what would be for three months or for six months to have dispassion. People say, what about this? What about, let's go to the full moon party. Let's go to the gym. Let's do this. Let's do that. I have no passion for any of those things. I'm dispassionate from the heart. It's almost impossible. Most people cannot conceive it. And when I say that, they say, won't you become dead if you do that? Like for some people to have passion, desires, attachments is almost equivalent in their soul, like with being alive, with being human. And Buddha comes and says exactly that. Yes. And if any one of you will have the courage to go beyond that, then indeed you will not be human. If you are so much in love with the human condition, go ahead, be human another 5,000 times and see if it takes you anywhere. So eventually it will take you to boredom and to kind of, okay, I've been human 10,000 times. I think Swami was right 5,000 lifetimes ago. And I think it's time for me to kind of let go. Yeah, I've been human and so what? I got a lot of falafels and I watched a lot of sunsets and I got blowjobs and whatever, you know, and, and so what? It just went on for another million years, so it was a big deal. No, eventually it's like running in circles. Eventually you still have to go beyond that. So the question is, of course, when do you feel prepared? When the soul inside you is asking for it? When something inside you says enough is enough? How many people have not seen a sick man, an old man, and a dead man? Everybody did. But when Buddha, first time in his life, saw those three, he freaked out and he lost his mind. Because for him, he was ripe. He had already lived 9,999 lives. And his subconscious mind was so bored with the whole thing, you know, that he just needed a spark to light that powder and to explode immediately into his quest for nirvana. It just took this much to trigger that man, because he was ripe. He was ready for it. So I'm not saying, as you know, that I very often say, I'm not saying that all of you in this room are ready today to put the efforts that Buddha and Milarepa and whoever else you want, Ramakrishna, have put into their quest. Because we all know that aspiration and motivation is different and of different levels and qualities for different people. So I would like to elucidate this issue because in these spiritualities which talk in black and white concepts, they basically depict a simplified kindergarten picture, exactly as we in Agama, in the first day of the courses, we give you a diagram with seven levels of the universe and corresponding to the seven levels of the universe, there are seven chakras. And those of, those of you who have done minimum four or five levels of Agama Yoga, now you know that that's a kindergarten way of depicting things because things are way more complex than that. But in the beginning, you would make a beginner crazy by trying to describe the whole picture. And that's why you have to, to start from a working model. You have to start from something which is simplified and which works. And then as they practice more and as they get to know more, you can give them a 3D vision, a more rich vision of the whole thing. 
The same thing with the ego. When people give you a kindergarten vision of the ego, they just depict things in black and white. God and the devil. Uh, God is the spirit and the devil is your ego. And therefore, whenever you are egoistic, you are ruled by the devil and the ego is your obstacle to spirituality, and ego must go out so that yoga will come in. And therefore, basically, most of the lineages of extreme yoga, and not only in India, they preach a concept which would be called annihilation of the ego. You have to terminate your ego. Your ego is your enemy. If you look at it in shades of gray or in color tones, you are going to find out that this was just a black and white story. Because in practice, for example, you cannot completely destroy your ego. Your ego contains the elements which make you breathe, which make you eat, which make you drink water, which make you kill viruses and bacteria and microorganisms which invade your territory. That's a manifestation of the ego. Why shouldn't you be selfless? And if a gazillion viruses and bacteria want to come and feed on you, you should be compassionate and generous and say, sure, it belongs to everybody. Why should I defend myself? But then your immune system would go down to zero and you'd die in maximum three days. Therefore, honestly, even Milarepa and Ramakrishna and the likes of them, they had some residual ego. They had to have some residual ego because otherwise they would die. There have been yogis who tried to push the envelope a little bit on it, just creating histrionic effects, just creating uh, theatrical effects. Like uh, Ma Ananda Mai, who was uh, notoriously a very, very enlightened uh, female guru and who liked to be very flipped in so many ways. She had a period of her life where she pushed her states of samadhi and her detachment and this egolessness so far that eventually she couldn't eat anymore. She lost the motivation to eat because her mind was telling her food outside you or inside you, what's the difference? Only the ego tells you that if it goes inside you, it's better or it's worth having, you know? That's just because you define the territory and you said what's inside this territory, it belongs to me. But ultimately, if you are completely equanimous, it's not. And Ma Ananda Mai couldn't get herself to eat. And when her disciples saw that she didn't eat for two, three days, they started feeding her with a spoon, like you feed two-month-old babies or, so, or one-year-old babies, you know? She couldn't eat, and she was spoon-fed by her disciples, like she was a handicapped, like she was a hysteric, a retard, or something, you know? She couldn't even eat. Now... If Jesus would have been not eating because he said, I have no ego, I care not about this body, you know, it's like people would have said, come on, man, this was a weirdo, you know, like there's, there are enough reasons to speak about Jesus and Buddha, like about terrible weirdos already. But if they couldn't eat and they couldn't like, then you would say, oh boy, you know, who wants to be like that, you know, it's like. Those people are damaged goods, you know, they probably had a lobotomy or something and now they are like, no, and that's supposed to be a desirable goal of life. Like who would want to be like that? You know, if you, if Buddha is a remarkable person, there may be people who say, I wish I was compassionate like Buddha. I wish I was wise like Buddha. I wish I was enlightened like Buddha. But if they would be Mananda Mai, sometimes you scratch your head and you say, do I really want to be like Mananda Mai? You know, it's like, I know she's considered to be an enlightened guru of the 20th century, but... I don't know if she is my role model, you know, like if I want to be quite like her. That's why first thing which I want to call your attention is this brutality of language that people speak about eradicating the ego or you don't eradicate it ever because if you eradicate it or annihilate it, you die. And of course, in spiritual practice, you still want to be on earth either because you have to do more spiritual practice and then you say, God, give me another five years to reach my crown chakra, then I can leave my body smiling, you know, there's no more problem. Or like Buddha, even after he reached his crown chakra, 
Buddha said, hey, I have to stay another 40 years on this prison planet and to create a dharma, to create a sangha, to help people to create a path which will help people to realize the truth, at least to teach them vipassana or to teach them something which can help them. So in this way, of course, in spirituality, although the ego is the enemy, the actual truth is that you don't want to kill it. The actual truth is that you want to diminish it until it becomes not disturbing, until it becomes within acceptable limits. It's exactly like some people compare the ego with your personal light and it's like you have a candle. And some people say, put out the candle of your ego. But in Tantra, they would put the problem more holistically, together with the macrocosm or the universe. They would say, what's happening in the morning when the sun is rising? What's the relevance of your candle? Like a candle in the dark, it's very relevant. Makes the difference between seeing and not seeing. But when you suddenly have a shining sun coming up, you can't even see the candle. Try to hold the candle in full sunshine. You barely can see it. The candle is such a dull light compared with the sunshine. So the sunshine in our example would be the spirit, God, the Shiva consciousness. And that's why the tantrics say, why do you bother to try to put down the candle when it would be much more productive to make the sun rise? Then what's the ego? Your ego says, I want this. And you are in full sunshine. And you say, beg your pardon? I didn't hear. No, like my ego becomes far, far away. It becomes like the fifth wheel of the cart, you know, like collateral, unimportant, redundant, you know. And then the ego has no sway or power. That's, that's the proper vision. That's the holistic vision. So you cannot say that you are eradicating the ego because literally that is not true. You can say that you are keeping the ego down so it doesn't become like Genghis Khan ego, so it doesn't become like Napoleon ego, and it doesn't become like kissing yourself in the mirror <coughs> ego, you know. That's ridiculous. That's too much. That's pathetic. But on the other hand, some level of ego for survival is absolutely necessary. And remember, even Jesus and Rumi and Milarepa, they had a sort of ego. Those of you who study the colors of the aura here in the, some of the more advanced levels of Agama, you remember that there are colors in the aura related to a painful, intense ego. And the same colors in a very bright and diluted form, they become a sort of a spiritualized ego, diluted to the point where it exists there for the sake so that you can eat. And, you know, if a car is coming towards you on the street, then you sidestep, you know, like minimal instinct of conservation, because you, it's your ego. No? But that ego is not holding the leadership in your being. That ego is just one of the consultants, one of the instruments, one of the smaller parts of your personality and of your inner being. So this being said, then you understand a little bit that Manipura is not really equivalent with ego, that there is a big ego in Manipura, but you cannot put an equivalent sign between them and that's why this is also related with the tantric and non-tantric view of life. That if you have a non-tantric view of life, you describe life like imprisonment in samsara or imprisonment in maya. And then the whole thing is just a prison break. You know, you just have to get out of this stupid reality which you hate and you fear and you want out of it. And prakriti, nature, is your enemy and your boogeyman. And in a tantric view of life, you don't hate yourself, your body, your limitations, because for a while, they actually fulfill a purpose. And therefore, 
even if you go and meet physically with Jesus, like his apostles did, you do that in a body, in a selfish body. They probably blessed the moment when they were born in that body, and they had the chance to physically meet with a being like Jesus. You know, it's like, whoa, glory to God that I was born in this century and in this place, and that I could physically connect with this man who brought in my life the inexpressible, the infinite. And thus, this thing to accuse the manifestation that it's a boogeyman, it's, it's ridiculous because everything happens in the manifestation, including the divine actions and the divine encounters and all that. So when you understand all these things, then especially those of you who do several levels in Agama, the other ones perhaps intuitively, you realize that every chakra is like a channel to God. For those of you who reached, again, fourth, fifth uh, level of teaching here in Agama, you remember clearly the issue of the sub-levels of the chakras, of going deeper, and you remember things like, you know, if you are working on Muladhara chakra, in a simplified kindergarten way, we can say, yeah, but you go in Muladhara chakra, and that's very primitive, it's the lowest of the chakras. But in the symbolism of the yogis, at the end of Muladhara chakra, there is Brahma. So actually conquering Muladhara chakra, acquiring the 100% arousing and activation of Muladhara chakra, would mean discovering Brahma. And Brahma is one of the basic personalities of God in Hinduism. It means the creator of the universe, the creative force. So actually, Muladhara alone, and it would take you to Brahma. That sounds very good. No, then what is the problem with the... So every chakra, in a certain way, you realize, some of you intuitively and some of you technically, that it can be deepened and perfected and be taken to its divine levels. Uh, some outshots, uh, some, some byproducts of the theosophical school, they even generated in some of this uh, theosophic and late theosophic literature, they generated a fascinating theory which they took from the hermetic Western tradition, which they called the theory of the seven rays, by which they said that exactly as everything is like the white light and the prism which reflects the six colors of the rainbow, so everything is an ensemble of seven colors, white plus the six components, exactly in the same way even the souls we have this metaphor, one of the metaphors, that the, the souls are like drops of water coming from an ocean. So the ocean is just spraying myriads of drops of water, which are individual existence, and all those drops of water, eventually they return to the ocean when you reach nirvana, when you reach the full spiritual realization. And this theory of the seven rays even says that as they have been emanated, those souls were not, in, not identical, they can never be, but even their similarity was limited because they were emitted like in a rainbow of colors, and each one of them caught a certain ray. So even the souls are originally, from the design, from the blueprint of the universal consciousness, even the souls are of seven types according to the seven families, according to the seven chakras. And therefore, you may meditate on this, what kind of soul am I? Of course, uh, you very much right now, you connect to your personality. That's why it will be very difficult to really evaluate it. On the other hand, there is another factor that your personality is the result of your previous 500 lives and your previous 500 lives, it's impossible that you did not somehow intuitively manifest a little bit of the ray of your soul. So if you are, let's say, born on the ray of Manipura chakra, then your soul is a Manipuristic type of soul. You are more inclined towards Karma Yoga than towards Bhakti Yoga. 
and you are more inclined to be a military saint like Saint George slaughtering the dragon or to be a samurai going on the path of Buddha with a sword or with two swords in the case of samurai rather than going in Anahata and being the Lamb of God or loving universally and unconditionally which again I'm not saying that one is better than the other. I'm not trying to put one down and the other up. I'm simply saying that it can be that your very soul has a dent on it, has a mark on it, has a seal on it, which makes it slightly preferential of some things in this universe. And this theory is a very strange theory, which says that eventually you will show your real face. Eventually, as you get closer and closer to your soul, your soul prefers this and that, and your soul doesn't prefer that and the other one. No. And there are people who would acknowledge that bhakti yoga is beautiful, like to love God is a very, very noble path, and it's not me. No, I prefer jnana. Art, nevertheless, when he did a march for salt, or other and other things, like his fast to death and so on. He didn't fast to death, but he was like fasting towards death. They were more manipuristic, provocative, fiery actions of karma yoga, denoting willpower, self-discipline, and other qualities, which were not specific the qualities of Anahata Chakra. So I would say, oh, this. Even the Anahata spiritualities value the path of Manipura a lot. They are afraid of it because they think that if Manipura takes over, then you will not be humble, surrendered, loving, forgiving. And they want Manipura, but they want a Manipura which is well-tempered. Like they want strong people serving their bhakti and their devotion. But they don't want those strong people to become too strong and to forget about the original goal of surrender, love, humbleness, forgiveness. So they are afraid of it, but when they are harnessed properly, they value the discipline like many of our people here, we do a tapas on the chakras, which is very, very valuable as spiritual practice. And uh, people work for a number of months, days, and so on, on one chakra alone. And many people doing this tapas of the chakras, it comes usually after four or five years of agama. It's not some one of the beginning stages. It's one, it's the third stage of practice here in agama. So quite advanced. And when people do anahata, they discover, and they do only Anahata, and not at all Manipura, Svadhisthana, nothing. They discover that they do less spiritual practice. Although Anahata is higher than what they did until then, they become like butterflies. They become like daisies. Hey, as the birds are chirping happily, so I'm so happy with my love for God. Did you do your two hours of practice today? No, that was on Manipura. On Manipura, I really did it, you know. I did eight, not two. On Manipura, I really pushed the end because I had a huge willpower. So we had people saying, it's funny. I loved God more. I felt more humble. And I did less practice. Like my discipline went to the dogs. No? Therefore, of course, uh, in Christian monasteries, as well as in some ashrams of bhakti yoga, they would like you to have a great anahata and some good amount of manipura besides it, so you don't miss out this part with discipline, practice, and all the rest. And that's why when they value the discipline, the determination, the courage, because sometimes you need to have a mad courage to just go ahead, the willpower, the dynamism, because some people are just becoming tamasic and they won't move, they won't budge. But dynamism, dynamism, fire, move, move, move. This is a world of change, change, change. Like the fire, which constantly burns and burns and burns and nothing resists. The fire consumes everything and transforms everything. And exactly in the same way, your Manipura Chakra is a force of dynamism and it gives you a force which comes from it. So I'm not talking now about the 100% Manipura path, the value of Manipura when it's alone there, 
but it can be blended with other things in your personality, and then it's usually valued when it's in the right proportion, when it doesn't take over, then it's kind of okay. And in some situations like the knights, as I quoted the example of the knights or the samurai, or but okay, the samurai, they were in a Manipuristic culture in Japan. The knights were Manipura people in an Anahata society in Europe. Uh, they were valued. It was okay for them to be 100% Manipuristic. No, when you look at the personality of El Cid, just watch the movie, the Charlton Heston movie, then you see that his attitude is of a perfect harmony on Manipura. That man is a consummate warrior, but he is a warrior for Jesus and not for himself. He, he is a samurai. He serves. He is, at some point, he has the opportunity of being proclaimed king. And he refuses. He is not in this to become king. He never wanted to become king, and from the beginning, he knew it's not about him being the king because he was not born from a royal family or anything, you know. And then he declines. A Manipura chakra, very great and still somehow very harmonious. So while I said in my previous lecture about Anahata that Anahata is very much lost in the modern world, even in countries like Russia, India, others, which had a bit of Anahata in their history, Today, Anahata is more and more lost. It's a, one of the big tragedies. And however, Manipura is not lost. Because everybody who wants to accumulate a lot of Bitcoin or whatever has some Manipura. There is a power in that and all that, even financial power. Even uh, the wolf of Wall Street, even a greedy wolf, Wall Street uh, stockbroker or something, that's Manipura. No, you make $100 million and then you have your retirement money and your financial freedom, that's Manipura. No, because then if you want to charter a private jet to go home instead of buying a ticket with Thai Airways, you just charter a private jet because $25,000, what it costs, is not that big deal when you have $100 million in your bank. You know? So it's a matter of freedom. Like I kick ass and I do whatever I want whenever I want. No? So it is Manipura. There is a lot of Manipura into that. So Manipura is not lost because we constantly see people thriving and uh, uh, being thrilled to get some Manipura under one form or another. No, but unfortunately, it is a Manipura which has become very dirty, very like impure, very disharmonious, very imbalanced, very selfish, very, as I said, disharmonious, mutilated. And because of this, for some people, the issue when they want to go follow a path with a lot of Manipura or have Manipura as the sidekick in spirituality, the issue is not of getting some Manipura. Yes, there are people in this room and in the spiritual universe who have a very poor Manipura. And if they have to get it, they have to work for it. They really have to work for it. Now, I have known people who after two years of steady work or something, they started feeling a consciousness based on Manipura, and, and they loved it. They fell in love with it. It was like their life was new. It's like a conquest, you know, like you, you have conquered a new standard in your life. But for many people, it's more an issue of purifying the Manipura, which is already there, harmonizing it, and directing it in a spiritual way. I know people with good Manipura, but they use it only to fulfill their own ego constantly. It's only for self-aggrandizement, it's only for self-satisfaction, it's only for blowing their own trumpet and beating their own drum, it's only for things that serve them and a couple of people that are happening to be in their entourage among their protégés, and therefore it's still a Manipura thing. It's like a gang spirit. It's me and my band of brothers. It's me and my gang. Most of these gang connections are Manipuristic. But it's one thing 
when people are all for one and one for all, like in the Three Musketeers, which is a sort of a clean Manipura friendship based on honor, decency, like the Three Musketeers would never, ever be dishonorable to each other or to somebody else in the outside, because then the others would pull their ear immediately and would say, that's not who we are. We are Athos, Portos, and Aramis, you know, we are like that, remember, no? So in this way, that's a clean Manipura, so it results in a value like friendship, but when it's a gang mentality, then it's like Alibaba and his 40 thieves in a den, no? And that is a dirty Manipura. So for many people, Manipura is more accessible because there is some of it there. No? Anything, a quarrel in a household. The husband and the wife are quarreling. You are a bitch, you are an asshole. No, you are a bitch, no, you are an asshole. You know? And everybody is trying to demonstrate that they are stronger than the other and that they are right. Such a quarrel is just a quarrel of ego. If it is a hysterical on Zvadistana, they start, start throwing dishes and screaming and doing hysterical's to each other. If it's on Manipura, they start beating each other and hitting each other, and they start using really power games on each other in those conflicts, you know? But it's still a war, and it's still a development of this. So, therefore, um, it has to be directed in a spiritual way, because it's very difficult for a person to have personal power and not to use that personal power in selfish ways. To be extremely strong and at the same time to be detached in some ways. Then the Typical Anahata values, because we are very used with Anahata spirituality, even people who come to yoga, because yoga in India, there was a lot of Anahata. Bhakti yoga is 90% of Indian yoga almost in the 20th century. And therefore, a lot of values are values of bhakti. And we can't, even the yogis, not to mention the Christian mystics in the West, they keep on talking about spiritual values, which somehow they have something to do with anahata. Like we speak about aspiration from the heart, <coughs> like a longing, like a loving longing for God. We speak about humility as the solid foundation of all other virtues. We speak about love, like unconditional love and all those. And then on Manipura, obviously those are not there. And that's why in Manipura, when you follow it, you are going to see that they are replaced by their harmonious equivalents in Manipura. Because there is a way of love in Manipura. But it's not called love, and emotionally and psychologically it doesn't manifest like love in the European culture, or in the Indian folklore, or in the Indian literature. It's different, no? People have noticed that until the twen late 20th century, in Japanese language, there was not one word for love. The words which are used for love were words which meant loyalty, duty. Like you love your father because you have a duty.
duty to your father. It's your duty to your father. But it's not about love. Because it's a city in Patagonia for those people, as I said. It's like, where? Who has this emotion in our village? Nobody. Nobody? No. Can you imagine a village of 3,000 people where not one of them has one millimeter of Anahata Chakra? And nobody even talks about it. It's not part, there is not a word in the language, for God's sake, for it. No. And uh, I know there is one of the famous novels of Japanese culture that we use here to define some elements on Manipura. And there a man is with a woman and he's displeased because she is not his romantic type of babe. And he says, but she doesn't love me. To, he complains to a third woman, to a third party. And that woman says, are you insane? Like this woman would die for you any minute because she's a samurai woman. And you complain that she doesn't love you. Like what more proof of love? You are so funny. In a Manipura culture, somebody can die for you, but they don't love you the way you do it in some sugar-coated or some romantic culture. Again, even if it's not romantic, even if it's the Anahata, the tragic Anahata of the Bollywood movies, or even if it's the tragic Anahata of the Russian culture of Andrei Tarkovsky or stuff like this, still, it's not there, and still, it means the same. And that's why, uh, remember that there will be always equivalents. Not identity, but those equivalents would also hold and work. For example, for Anahata people, aspiration is like a longing. Like, I don't know why, but I'm longing for God. It's like God is my lover, and I haven't seen him for a million years. You know, and I'm longing for him like a flower is longing for water. You know, I need to be, I'm withering without the presence of the beloved. But in Manipura, that becomes commitment. Like, I commit myself to be a samurai or to be this for the rest of my life. There will be never, ever coming out of it or changing my mind or something. It becomes loyalty. Like, I'm loyal to my Buddhist monastery or something. Loy I can die for it. Nobody will change me. I'm like the soldier of God's army. It becomes determination. It becomes willpower. It becomes like people who say, I'm joining Shambhala because I want to be in God's army. That's not a very Anahata concept. Shambhala has the concept of Shambhala, for those of you who know what it is, for the others it will come up soon, uh, inevitably in some of the satsangs or in some of the lectures in your courses. Shambhala is a big, big spiritual issue which uh, needs to be known by all spiritual practitioners sooner or later. So even in Shambhala, there are aspects which are strictly Anahata, Vishuddha, Sahasrara, everything. But there's also a Manipuristic aspect that they are the guardians of the planet Earth. And the guardians are a sort of a police, you know, they are the police of the place. And thus, uh, in, ev in this aspiration, in exists on Manipura. But in Manipura, try to think about the aspiration of the old knights or of the samurai or of the kshatriya, the aspiration to their goals. The love from Anahata becomes uh, the Manipuristic and generally Buddhistic and Asian versions of love. It is actually called kindness or kindliness. It's called in European translations, loving kindness. If it is mixed with the great spirit of Ajna, it can become even compassion. But it's not love. Loving kindness, as defined in Buddhism, is a typically Manipura attitude. It's an attitude of goodwill, of benevolence, of generosity, of sympathy. But all those are not love. The definition of love is not that I love you, therefore I'm generous to you and I'm sympathetic to you. And people say, I don't need your sympathy. I don't need your generosity. I want your love. Because it's not the same thing. You are not paying, it. one is Anahata and the other one is Manipura. When you see most of the Buddhist masters of Asia, including the Dalai Lamas and this, you don't see Anahata. I'm not saying that some of them don't. Seldom it happens. 
but you see a lot of extremely nice Manipura. The Manipura of the benevolent king. The Manipura full of generosity, of goodwill, and which can die for you. That Manipura can die for you. So it's full of self-sacrifice, loyalty, and everything. But still it's not love. It's not the same as love in terms of the energy. Humility, which what is humility in Anahata, then it becomes service. It becomes being of service, selfless service, like in the case of Mahatma Gandhi. It becomes consecration, consecration to God. Do the right thing. It becomes karma yoga. No? So it is humility, like it's not me. All glory be to God. No? It's like you remember Henry V, who definitely was not depicted as an Anahata person. Henry V, the, in the famous play of William Shakespeare, who is defined as a very Manipuristic person, you know, by what he says and what he does. Henry V, when he discovered that he won the incredible battle of Azincourt, where he was dominated by the French five to one, more than five to one, and his people were tired and exhausted and without food, and the French were fresh and ready to kick ass, and still the British won, and they won in a crushing way because they had a thousand aristocratic chivalrous fighters, and only two died of those 1,000, while they were fighting 5,000 knights from France who died like they were pulverized, you know, like they were killed with machine guns, you know. There was no logical explanation, you know. And when he found the result, Henry V says, let it be proclaimed in my whole army that if anybody brags about victory today in Azincourt, I shall hang them with my own hand. Because we did not won here today. God won for us. This is not logical. A thousand tired people cannot beat 5,000 good fighters and so on. Here there was a miracle happening. And he says, let it be proclaimed. If anybody brags that they won a battle, I'll kill them with my own hand. And he said, the first thing before we pick up the wounded from the fields, we go to the church and give praise to God. Because this is inexplicable. But this is the kind of humility no, like Henry V could have said, am I not the ultimate king, boys? Have I not taken you to victory? He immediately became humble on Manipura. He said, all glory be to God. Te Deum, to you, O God. You know, it's like, this is, there is a humility on Manipura, which is a sort of a respectful acknowledgement, like a military almost acknowledgement, which you see in chivalry, Nice. Other values from Anahata, they have uh, equivalents like faith and devotion. It's one way to have faith and devotion from the heart. And it's a much more fiery and almost violent way to have faith and devotion from Manipura Chakra. Even Rumi discovers this. He says, I love you with passion and you respond back to me with serenity. Like, Rumi does not have any serenity. He says, oh God. And God has serenity, you know. Like, I don't share your fieriness, you know. I know you love me in a fiery way. And it's good. You are very sweet to watch. You know? But I'm not doing that. I'm loving you with serenity. You know? And Rumi acknowledges. He says, you accept my passion. He has passion with the serenity of true love. And he says, ah, one day I shall be a lover like you. You know, like now I'm still a, a human lover, a man who mixes Anahata with my Arabic, Persian temperament, because Rumi was Persian of origin, you know, and he had this Manipura of the Middle East people, you know. He had this Persian Manipura, you know, and he says, but he says, that's not... The perfect thing, but hey, it's still good. No, so he has a love which is with, he has his own brand of faith and devotion, being helpful to all, like from Anahata, which again becomes forms of service. Uh, grateful gratitude on Anahata feels in a certain way, and it's with tears, and gratitude on Manipura, it's much more vertical 
and structured, not that there is anything wrong with the one on Anahata, but they feel and they go in a different way. To everything, to be thoughtful, to be indifferent to praise, but open to criticism from others, to speak moderately, to speak with a smile, to speak that is good and true, to have contentment, to have forgiveness. There is forgiveness on Manipura. That's why the environment which generated the idea, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, is still not very pure. Because even in Manipura environments like Buddhism and others, they conceived a sort of forgiveness in an engineering way. Buddha says from Ajna, if somebody commits evil and the other person commits evil back because of the karma, and you again commit evil in the next life, and then they come again and there is a vendetta which goes like this over a hundred lives, it's like a pendulum which goes non-stop from left to right, and it cannot be stopped. So one of you has to stop it. So when the pendulum is on your side, then you just bring it back to zero, put it down, and say, now it stops. And therefore, he defines this forgiveness not as an act from Anahata. He defines it as a self-control from Manipura and as a logical thing from Ajna, that real intelligence should make everybody see that revenge is useless and an eye for an eye, as Gandhi said, leaves the whole world blind. You know? It's not from Anahata. It's Manipura and Ajna. And that's why Buddha said, every time when an evil is forgiven on the face of this earth, that much evil dies. It's like you dematerialize it and send it back to the void. You know, like there is some evil, what to do with it? Like we have garbage. You know, like people have residues. Waste, nuclear waste, and what to do with it, wherever you put it, it pollutes the planet. If you could have a vacuum cleaner to dematerialize it and turn it into void, that would be perfect. That would be the perfect solution. No? Buddha says there is such a solution with the evil. Every time when there is evil and so on, you can just stop, analyze, take a conscious decision, forgive it. It's not a forgiveness which comes from the heart, but it's still a forgiveness. The final result is the same karmically speaking. And as I said, friendship is one, ship about the friend, one thing about the friendship from Anahata, which I spoke about three weeks ago, or four, whatever it was, and there is a totally different thing about the friendship from Manipura, which can be a great comradeship and which can surpass the limits of one's ego. When you are ready to die for your comrade, then where is the ego? Oh, and many people have experienced this even in military environments, in Manipura environments, where there was no Anahata. So all in all, many, many spiritual values are on Manipura and spirituality with Manipura. If you are a yogi with Manipura, then you will go and do things. You will have some imperialism, some, but a spiritual imperialism, uh, you know, like, Yoga is so good that the whole world should hear about it. In Tibet, where they have a, quite a good Manipura, you know, even for the fact that they have to stand 20 degrees below zero frost for so long time and so on, they call it the lion's roar, that if you became a spiritual being, you are like the lion which goes on the roof of the house and roars, like let the whole valley hear that the lion is here and that the lion has something to say. No, you have become like a Buddha, you have become like a Karmapa or like a Dalai Lama, you roar. You go to Argentina, you go to Korea, you go to Patagonia, you go to, that's Argentina as well, maximum, most of it. You go to Northern Russia or wherever you go and you roar. There is a imperialistic tendency, you know, that you want to spread what you have is very valuable and you shine like the sun. You shine, wherever you go, you shine because you've got a message. Jesus couldn't hold his life, his mouth closed, no? He said, I came to bring you the good tidings. Like, why don't you just shut up and eat your breakfast? No, well, come and bring the good tidings. Because he was rising, he was shining like the sun. It was coming out of him. Obviously, Jesus had a huge Manipura. And obviously, in his case, it was a harmonious, good, useful Manipura which was there. Even Francis of Assisi, who is a 
most of his behaviors are the behaviors of a hysterical mystic. But at some point in the middle of, he got like bored, you know, it's, can't even say why he did it. And in those days, to go from Italy to Palestine, where Palestine was under this Sultan Jalaluddin or whatever his name was, uh, one of the big sultans who conquered the holy places and then it was a Muslim for centuries, in the 12th century, in the 13th century. No, to go from Italy to Palestine, first of all, there were eight chances out of ten that you will not survive, that you will die at sea, that you will, there will be pirates, that there will be highway robbers, that you will be taken prisoner religiously and so on. Like it was a madness. All these people who did pilgrimages to the Holy Land, today you can go to Jerusalem and see the holy places. And if you pass through the passport control of the Israeli police, you go and you will see the holy places. No, but in the 12th century, on the 13th century, this was madness. And not only that Francis of Assisi went, but he didn't go to see the holy places. Guess why he went? Francis of Assisi went to convert the, is the, the Muslim sultan to Christianity. He went like a missionary and his goal was nobody else than the sultan. Like why should you waste time with smaller people when if you convert the sultan, you know? And we, he got an audience and he told directly, imagine there was a whole retinue and he said, the sultan, I come here in the name of Jesus Christ to convert you to Christianity. Everybody's jaw dropped, you know, like, this is just a madman, right? He's a hysterical. This is like Jehovah's Witnesses. You no, know? it's some idiot who comes and knocks at your door to give you some good tidings and to convert you to his sect. What the heck is he doing, you know? And he said, look, you must be deranged mentally. Or it's like, what's this? You know? And he said, Sultan, I don't want to speak without argument. So I'm like, just let's not beat around the bush too much. Let's go to the facts. I want to demonstrate to you that Jesus is God and all that comes out of that. And so I'm just going to propose a simple test. Let your servants make a huge fire in the middle of this room. Make place. <coughs> make a huge fire, a bonfire. And I and whoever you designate from your retinue will walk straight into that fire praying to God. And the one which the fire will not burn it means that God is with him, and that shows the power of God with that one and with his religion. Their jaw dropped 50 centimeters more, you know, because like, not this guy, not only that he was a madman, but he was a dangerous madman who was suggesting an insane experiment. And the Sultan simply told him, I don't think I'll find anybody in my retinue who wants to do that contest with you. So it will remain without answer, at which Francis upped the ante, went to the next level. He said, then, Sultan, make the fire anyway, and I alone shall walk into the fire, praying to God. And if I'm not getting burned, then you convert to Christianity. Of course, he didn't dare to do even that. No, because imagine what would have happened if, if the madman would have got his way. And the sultan told him, uh, Francis, you came to Jerusalem to make a convert. That's not possible. If I would convert to Christianity, they would kill me and you instantaneously. The others will never understand this. But you have obtained a friend. You didn't make a convert, but you made a friend. Like the sultan took off his hat. No, he said, like, this guy is something like you don't see too often in history. No? And ever since, the sultan uh, gave free access to the sites of worship, to the tomb of Jesus and all that, no? because of Francis of Assisi. No? This is a saint that must have some Manipura. Even the fact that he didn't say he would walk on water. Then he had a big Zvadistana, right? He said he would walk into fire. There must have been a huge Manipura there. So, 
Um, there are so many of the great stories of spiritual success, which are stories, first of all, of Manipura. Like when you look at the life of Milarepa, sure, in the final stages you see that Milarepa got Siddhis, development of Ajna Chakra, that he was at the highest levels of consciousness. That's without any doubt. But in the beginning, the 30 years of the practice of Milarepa, they are just Manipura, 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 Manipura again. Like somebody who has that kind of self-discipline, that kind of willpower. And when my, his guru was punishing him because he did black magic. And Milarepa tried to steal the, one of the secret mantras from his guru. He signed false papers in the name of his guru to a distant disciple by which he claimed that the guru sent him to that disciple because the guru said, I don't have time, you give the initiation to this guy. And the disciple saw the seal of the guru and everything. He believed. No, because this guy was a, but this guy was a disciple in kindergarten. He was a disciple, no, so much Manipura he had that he was cheating his own guru. He falsified the signature, like in, in Indian ashrams and in Tibetan monasteries, not many people would dare go to that length. No? And Milarepa was such a Manipuristic person that he, he said, the bloody idiot doesn't give me the mantra. I'm sitting here and digging ditches instead of doing mantras and visualizations. How long does he think I'm going to wait? I'm getting old. I'm going to die soon and I still didn't get the mantra initiation. Give me the bloody thing and if he doesn't want to give it to me, I will take it by myself. I'm just going to go and break into his house and, you know, and all that, all that stuff. And he did. So he, even the story of his spiritual life and practice is a story of great Manipura. But that great Manipura made him the, um, the most formidable yogi of Tibetan history. Because you can imagine that people like El Sid and this kind of people, if they would be asked to do uh, some yoga, how they would do it? Did you do your two hours of yoga today? Uh, no, uh, my friend was leaving the island. No, it was a little bit too hot today. Can you imagine El Sid hiding behind such pathetic excuses? You know? Did you do your yoga today? Oh, I, uh, I fell off the motorbike and I twisted my ankle. Does that mean you cannot do five hours of yoga in that day? You're just sitting and looking at your ankle and you're crying like a beaten dog. Oh, 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 look at my ankle. No, but can't you do some, do your, do a headstand. No, that doesn't require any ankle work, you know. Do a shoulder stand. What has that got to do with the ankle? Do some pranayama sitting on a chair, you know. Do you think that El Sid would have stopped his spiritual practice because he had a twisted ankle? Oh, I have a little pain in my pinky little finger. No, people would find like, what's this? No, when you have a good Manipura, these things do not exist. And there is no obstacle to say, oh, but something happened and, you know. So that's why Manipura has a great function. No, I have seen uh, tem temperaments and, you know, specific structures where people would be, for example, like Svadhisthana, Anahata. And having a Christian aspiration, love, longing, and so on. But then they would be like butterflies. They would not have this solidity which Manipura can give to one's spiritual practice and so on. And then the path which they would follow would be a different path. Now, there is a story in the Fathers of the Desert with a monk who was lazy like he had no self-discipline on Manipura. And then they asked him, what will he do when he dies? When he said, well, I tried to follow some discipline. And I read that Jesus said that if you don't condemn anybody in your mind, in your heart, then God will not condemn you when you die. And then he said, all my life, that's what I did. I never, I tried never to pass judgment on anybody. Any asshole, any idiot, any you know, and so on who did obviously things, 
I never say, I always said, I'm not the one to pass judgment. I cannot pass judgment. I'm not worthy to pass judgment on this. I, I'll go away. I'm going to hide somewhere. I will not judge. I'll not say this person is bad or something. I don't know. Only God knows if this person is really bad or something. I will not dare to. And he said, I did this, you know. Like he didn't have Manipura, but he, at least he did something else. <clears throat> so I'm not saying again that without Manipura is impossible, but then you will have other paths which will be more twisted, more weird, more delicate in some other ways. One over the other, I was contemplating because many people said, what about Vishuddha Chakra? Why don't you make a retreat on Vishuddha Chakra or something? Because it's very spiritual and so on. So I was thinking about one of our teachers in the school here in one of the previous years. He even made a retreat, like we have the meditation retreats, on Manipura from one end to the other. It was called, if you look at the previous timetables of Agama, it was called Consciousness of Fire. So like for some people, even the fire means a huge spiritual victory because they are Svadhisthanistic jellyfishes and confused and living in the lower chakras. And at least if you'd be in Manipura, you'd be at least at the level of a samurai or something like this. That would already be some form of superiority. Now, not to mention that it can go even further than this. So after I spoke about the role of Anahata Chakra, I thought about highlighting a little bit the roles of Manipura, perhaps the role of Vishuddha, Ajna. Again, I don't know if I'm going to go in every single chakra, but just a few of the more frequently used ones, or the few at least of the least understood ones, for you to start having a more clear image of what the spiritual path actually involves. So, I will not say more. This, I think there have been enough ideas for you to think about. Uh, with this, we'll conclude the satsang. And I see that in good time, because we have competition, and uh, I hope you all know that next week there will not be a satsang precisely because of that, because that thing is going to go on like crazy for about five, six days. So, therefore, um, we'll simply patiently wait for this to go away and then we'll do more of our things. So I will see you in the next satsangs, look at the calendar, see when they are, and with this we have finished for tonight. If again this produces, if such satsangs, uh, they produce questions in you, write them down, remember them, and when we have Q&A sessions, come and ask me, uh, questions which are caused by the subject of such satsangs. Enough for tonight.